Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you like this episode, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment or two. Then subscribe and click on the bell to receive notifications of whenever we release new videos. Also, please remember to share them to your social media. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us back to the area around Big Delta, Alaska. Fairbanks is about 60 miles to the northwest, and the confluence of the Tanana and Delta Rivers is nearby. To the north lie the White Mountains, with the Granite Mountains to the southeast. The Alaska Range provides the boundary to the southwest, and is by far the largest range of the three. Along the Delta River, the topography flattens out, and oxbows in the river form, creating brushy fingers that fill with salmon and conceal moose, black bears, and brown bears. With high mountains in which to hibernate and flat brushy places to catch salmon, this area is prime habitat for bears of any type. Late summer of 1977, 30-year-old Cynthia Dussel Bacon was in her third year completing geological field mapping for the Alaska Geology Branch of the United States Geological Survey. This involved her spending time alone in very remote stretches of the Alaska wilderness. Spending up to a week at a time in the backcountry while unarmed, she was vulnerable and exposed to constant danger. Cynthia was a brilliant woman who appreciated science, learning, and the outdoors. Charlie, her husband of only five months, also worked as a geologist for the U.S. Geological Survey. It wasn't an everyday occurrence, but spotting a bear every once in a while was part of the experience. Cynthia had a limited amount of training on how to handle injuries and animal altercations. Each time she had run into a bear over the previous years, they had either been unaware of her presence or dashed off in terror. She had never to this point had a frightening or dangerous encounter with any bear. Off and on through the survey, the expedition had been supported with a helicopter to fly them into remote areas. When they weren't supported with a helicopter, they had to rely on performing their professional duties from their backpacks. This year, helicopter support funding had been approved, so they would be ferried in and out of locations that way. Cynthia's walkie-talkie was a vital tool in her safety and comfort. She was required to check in by radio every few hours with a pilot's wife, who acted as the coordinator for the project. This regular contact reassured Cynthia that help wasn't far away, in concept, and that if she didn't check in, someone would soon investigate. Her days would pass with radio check-ins with base every few hours, and the rest of the time passed with her pulling rock samples. After analyzing and notating the type of rock she found, and locating it on her map, she would hike to another spot and repeat the same process. At the end of each day, she would hike to the bottom of the ridge and meet Ed on a gravel bar along the creek to fly back to base camp for the night. Primary assumption during the 70s was that as long as anyone in the backcountry made noise when they traveled, avoided surprising and feeding bears, and didn't get between a bear's food or them and their cubs, they would tend to flee from human sight. Their primary nature was one of avoidance of humans and not predating on them or defending their territory from them. At this point in history, carrying a firearm into the backcountry was believed to be more dangerous than a confrontation with a bear. The belief was that an injured bear would be more dangerous and aggressive than a curious bear that would leave unharmed. The problem with that line of thinking is that it assumed that bears were merely curious and would leave without harm. At 8 a.m. August 13, 1977, helicopter pilot Ed Spencer dropped Cynthia off on a rocky ridge with her assigned survey area having already been mapped out. Cynthia carried with her a light lunch, her walkie-talkie, her geologist's hammer, and a map of her location. Her lunch was some baked beans, canned fruit, along with some juice and crackers. This combination of energy-rich foods was designed to help power her through her day of rock-hounding and hiking. One unanticipated aspect of this sweet lunch was that bears also enjoy sugar and can smell it from miles away. At the end of the workday, Cynthia began to make her way down the slope when she came across an old machine trail that had long since been abandoned, but allowed a sloped path down an otherwise steep ridge. It wasn't exactly easy going, as it traversed scree slides and was entangled by thick brush, but it was easier going than the alternative. Running into a bear was always in the back of Cynthia's mind when she was in the field. 
As she studied the trail, she could see the green and bushy growth along the Seltzer River, and between it, dry and tangled low brush that didn't seem likely to house a bear or any other large animal. This part of the ridge also hosted several private cabins, which she expected bears to avoid. She carefully planned her descent from small rise to small rise, so that she could use them as vantage points as she approached her pickup location. As Cynthia arrived at each of her waypoints, she would stop and collect rock samples and chart them on her map. Before continuing, she would look over the territory below and ahead of her to make sure she wasn't going to run into any bears in her descent. As she pulled samples from the rocky knob, she noticed an interesting sample. She took her hammer out and broke it free from its mother rock for closer examination. As Cynthia held the sample close, a sudden crack disrupted her focus from only a few yards away. She quickly looked down slope and saw a black bear lift its head above the brush and turn in her direction from only ten feet away. At first she felt relief at it being a black bear as opposed to a grizzly. Added to that, this black bear seemed smaller than many of the others, who had dashed into the brush at first sight of her previously. She was convinced that this bear would do the same, after Cynthia showed it she was a human being. Guided by the prevailing wisdom at the time, and her experience, Cynthia decided to strike fear into the bear by yelling and waving her arms at it. She yelled, Go away! and Get out of here! at the bear while clapping her hands together. The black bear was not intimidated by her display of power and command. Its stone-faced glare relayed the bear's lack of fear of the woman and filled her with an increasing terror she had a hard time controlling. The black bear's head dropped below the bushes, and it slowly walked toward her up the small incline between them. As it continued closer, it stared directly into Cynthia's eyes, as if it were curious more than angry. It didn't growl or raise its hackles, so it was clearly not afraid of her. With the bear only a few feet away from her, Cynthia pounded her rock hammer on the stony outcropping at one more attempt to drive it off. She screamed more vociferously and waved her arms demonstrably as she took a few slow steps up the slope. The black bear suddenly broke off its advance towards Cynthia and ran a quick circle around her into the brush. She had completely lost sight of the bear as it was now concealed by the tangled brush completely surrounding her. She scanned the hillside, hoping to see it disappearing into the distance. The next sensation Cynthia felt was being driven onto her face from an overwhelming force from behind her. She froze because she knew that the source of this impact had to be the bear, and she hoped it would think she was dead and leave. As she lay face down, she felt the searing pain and immense pressure of the bear biting onto her right shoulder. With each toss of its head, the bear's teeth penetrated deeper into her flesh, she was powerless to resist any movement of the bear, as it seemed to be many times stronger than her. Her head and arms flailed violently as the bear shook her with irresistible force. Then it paused and listened and watched Cynthia for any signs of life or defense. She now knew the bear was not attacking out of defensive motives, as it had clearly seen she was a human and had more than ample opportunity to flee. Her mind raced, and she knew she had to reach out for help. Her radio was the only means of contacting anyone who could intervene, and it was secured in her backpack. Reaching her left arm behind her, Cynthia groped around, trying to pull her walkie-talkie from its buckled pouch on her pack. Her movement set off a renewed round of biting and thrashing by the bear. It still gripped her right shoulder in its jaws and bit down even harder. The clicking of the bear's teeth against her bones horrified Cynthia, as the seriousness of this attack grew desperate. Powerless to resist the bear's aggression, she did her best to lay still as it bit her shoulder, arm, and right side of her body in rapid and painful attacks. She knew that her best hope was to convince the bear that she was dead, so it would leave. But each time the bear bit into her, it tossed its head and ripped her flesh, causing tremendous pain and damage. Redirecting its attack on her head, the bear bit into the flesh of her scalp and ripped and tore patches loose, chewing and swallowing them as it did. Each time the bear returned to pull more flesh from her head, she could hear the bear's teeth grate against her skull and feel the pressure of each of its teeth against her bones. Cynthia's mind flashed as she recalled that bears don't kill first. They simply start eating until their prey dies of blood loss, which could take a very long time. She considered fighting back just to speed up her own death and minimize her suffering, but held on to the hope that it would leave her alone somehow. 
The bear began to change its position and dug its canines into her arm. It pulled her down the slope several yards as she did her best to play dead and stay limp, despite being jabbed by sticks and poked by rocks. The effort soon tired the bear and it paused to pant its hot breath into her ear. It was clearly watching her for any signs of life or resistance. The blood seeping from one of the holes ripped into her side drew the bear's attention. It began to lick her blood before it resumed dragging her through the brush down the hill. Pulling the combined weight of Cynthia and her pack through the brush for several more yards, the bear found a place to rest once again. Dragging 150 pounds through tangled brush and over rocks and duff was draining, even if it was downhill. After around 30 minutes of exertion, the bear decided to retreat a few feet from Cynthia and laid down to rest. While panting to regain its energy, it continually stared at her, making sure she didn't escape. The bear had retreated toward Cynthia's right side, leaving her undamaged left arm hidden from its eyes. She again groped around her backpack to try to access her walkie-talkie. Due to the bear dragging her or some other aspect of the attack, the buckle on the pocket containing the walkie-talkie was now open. She slowly felt around the inside of the pocket and withdrew the walkie-talkie stealthily. Somehow she carefully clicked the power button on and extended the radio antenna without drawing any reaction from the resting bear. Bringing the radio close to her mouth, she spoke into the microphone, uttering, Ed, this is Cynthia. Come quick. I'm being eaten by a bear. She repeated her plea for help and relayed her location before the bear rose to its feet. In only a few bounds, the bear was back in a renewed attack, but this time on her left arm. Its teeth ripped new wounds, and its claws gashed her only remaining hope to hold on to her radio, her lifeline. Cynthia understood that she hadn't been able to fully extend the antenna before sending her urgent message. She also recognized that she was in a ravine, which would limit how far her signal would travel. She'd done all she could do, and now hoped that someone's voice would crackle across the radio. She longed for confirmation that her message was received and help was on the way. Realizing that playing dead had not deterred the bear, Cynthia cried out and yelled while it attacked her left arm. She remained face down as she heard the bear sniffing her body and felt its hot breath on her thighs and calves. Fear welled up that it would bite into her legs and open up wounds there, which would bleed much more than those in her arms and shoulder. For some reason Cynthia's backpack drew the bear's attention. It tore at the pack and began crunching on the cans she'd brought for her lunch. Her mind raced to find anything she could do to aid in her rescue. The pressure of the bear's mass pressed her flat on the ground as it munched her lunch for the next ten minutes. In the distance, the familiar sound of a helicopter approached her location and lifted her spirits. Had they heard her cries for help over the walkie-talkie? Would they arrive in time to save her life? Sounds of the helicopter grew louder as it approached, then circled her location, then it disappeared, draining her hope of immediate rescue. Her heart sank as she considered it may have simply been moving one of the other geologists to a new location or refueling at the nearby gas depot. The sound of the helicopter had no effect on the bear, and it finished eating Cynthia's lunch. The blood seeping from the wound ripped into the side of her back drew the bear's attention once again. It bit and chewed at her flesh, consuming chunks of her body as she refused to react to the pain. The helicopter suddenly began to circle her location once again, and soon hovered directly over her. Cynthia kicked her legs to show the pilot she was there, since her arms were numb and wouldn't move. Then the helicopter flew up and over the ridge just above her, and out of sight. The hopeless feeling of abandonment set in once again, this time with abiding cruelty. Even though the helicopter was not there, Cynthia could sense that the bear had left as well. Undoubtedly, the noise and presence of the helicopter had run the bear off, at least temporarily. Cynthia lay still and quiet for another ten minutes, before she could hear the helicopter returning from over the ridge. This time it landed a few hundred yards above her. Its engines shut down, and voices followed. Cynthia wasn't going to let this opportunity for rescue slip away. She began yelling in response to the voices, but understood that the brush around her concealed her location. Soon Ed approached her and called out to the other two women who had accompanied him. The three of them carried Cynthia back up the ridge and eventually managed to place her in the back seat of the helicopter. As they flew her toward Fort Greeley and Delta Junction, Ed radioed ahead to make sure the medical staff there were prepared to help Cynthia. During the flight, Cynthia had time to evaluate her own injuries. 
She knew the bear hadn't managed to damage her internal organs, but also acknowledged that her arms had been severely mangled during the attack. She knew she would live, but the quality of her life was called into question in her mind. After landing at the army base, medics there set up a blood transfusion and worked hard to stabilize Cynthia's condition. Treating her pain with morphine, they prepared to transport her to Fairbanks for emergency surgery. At the army base hospital, her wounds were cleaned and any dead tissue was removed. Cynthia's left arm was amputated between her elbow and her shoulder, since most of her forearm tissues had been consumed by the bear. In a five-hour effort to save her right arm, surgeons grafted a blood vessel from her left leg down the length of her right arm. This operation ensured a steady blood supply that would save her right arm. After an overnight stay in Fairbanks, Cynthia was flown to San Francisco and placed in intensive care at Stanford Hospital. Within a week of her arrival, a blood clot had formed in her right arm, causing it to grow cold and a pulse could no longer be detected there. Cynthia developed a high fever, and doctors feared that an infection had set in. Rushed into the operating room, surgeons soon realized that the tissues in Cynthia's arm had begun to rot all the way up to the top of her shoulder. They immediately amputated it to prevent it from spreading infection through the rest of her body. Though the amputation was a success, medical staff had discovered that the wound in Cynthia's side was prone to repeated infection. As the bear consumed her flesh there, it had eaten a lymph node assigned to fighting off infection in that area. Surgeries utilized skin grafts pulled from other areas of Cynthia's body to cover up the exposed muscle and bone in her side. For six more weeks, Cynthia endured painful skin grafts as IVs of fluids and antibodies pushed back the infection. Though the bear had chewed through the brachial arteries in each of her arms, Cynthia somehow survived the attack. Her youth and excellent condition undoubtedly aided in her survival and recovery. Following her attack, Cynthia found out that her SOS had been heard by Ed's wife at the command center. While searching for her, he had had a hard time piloting and looking for her simultaneously, so he left to get assistance. The second time he arrived, he could find no safe place to land near her and had to leave to locate a more desirable landing spot. In the analysis of Cynthia's attack, squaring the circle of determining the cause of her attack is important. If she startled the bear as it slept, why didn't it run away? When it had a good opportunity to flee, it circled around her and ambushed her from behind. Did the bear see Cynthia's sudden presence as a threat? If this were the case, then it seems it would have fled soon after the threat she posed was disabled. Was Cynthia's attack strictly predatory? Given there were no cubs present at her attack and no animal carcass was found cached nearby, did the bear see her as an opportunity to eat? This seems to be the apparent motivation to her attack, as the bear did slowly stalk toward her after having ample opportunity to flee. It cleverly set up an ambush even after it knew it had been seen. It chewed away portions of her body and ate it. The bear also dragged her down the hill, trying to get her into the trees to cache her body. These are each predatory behaviors and answer any question in my mind as to its motives. There is one more detail that casts a shade of doubt on this conclusion. Ed had requested that the Alaska Fishing Game find and destroy that bear and test it for rabies, given its behavior was so out of the norm. Their efforts in this search did locate a single bear, which they shot and killed. Upon examining the bear, they discovered it was a sow, and soon thereafter they located a one-year-old cub and left it to fend for itself. During the necropsy on the sow, the examiners found a small amount of blueberries in her stomach and mystery fluid, which they concluded may have been Cynthia's tissues dissolved by digestion. There was nothing conclusively linking the sow to Cynthia, though. Cynthia eventually healed as much as she could from such a devastating attack. She was fitted with a prosthetic arm on what remained of her left arm, but there was nothing to attach one to on her right shoulder. She trained herself to utilize her feet as additional hands and returned to her duties as a wife and geologist eventually. Cynthia exhibited extreme determination in both her survival and her adaptation to life after losing her arms. Her story is one of the most inspiring stories I've ever heard and is discussed in many books and articles. She went on to author reference manuals with her husband regarding geological distributions in Alaska and other regions. After reviewing the facts surrounding this episode, I'm left with a few questions for you. Was Cynthia's attack a defensive or predatory attack? Do you think the fishing game hunters killed the bear that attacked Cynthia? 
Is it possible the sow did attack Cynthia after being unable to locate her one-year-old cub? Would bear spray or a firearm have prevented Cynthia's attack? I will gladly read and respond to your thoughts, so please post them in the comments section below, and let's talk about it. Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider clicking on the like button and clicking on the bell icon. We'll help you know when we post our new episodes. Posting our video links to your social media profiles furthers awareness, and it's fun. We slashed our prices in our merch store, linked below. So check out the bargains there while you shop. As a member of our human community, remember to adventure bravely and be careful out there, especially in bear country.